Welcome and thank you so much for joining us here at GitLab. Uh, we're going to walk you through today the evolution of the Kubernetes landscape. Context wise, my name is Brandon Young. I serve as the VP of Alliances for GitLab. History wise, I started my career at IBM, but the reason that is going to be most interesting today is uh, I spent most of the last 10 years at Google and I was part of the team uh, that helped launch Kubernetes. Uh, Joe Beta, Brendan Burns, Craig McClucky, and later Brian Grant and Tim Hawken have done all the hard work, but there was also a part of this is getting a bunch of partners, uh, a bunch of co contributors, and a larger number of other people on board, and that was really what my job was at, at Google. So I want to give you guys a little context, like think of how we got here. Uh, I currently uh, also serve on the board of the Linux Foundation. So Context though, why GitLab? What are we doing in the space and how are these kind of two related before we jump in to uh, the entire um, landscape? So first off, GitLab and all of our fun started back with a focus on developer productivity. And to make it easy, I'm gonna spend a lot of today running through and giving you guys some clear opportunities to look at this. We're a single DevOps tool, uh, not a chain focused on allowing developers to focus on what they really want to do, which is develop the code and deploy it into Kubernetes. You can deploy anywhere, but we're going to focus clearly on Kubernetes for most of today. Uh, give you a context of what we do. We focus all the way from planning and what you want to run through how you store and run that in source code management, uh, how you package it up in a container registry, uh, how you secure that in your CI pipeline through your uh, static code analysis, dynamic code analysis, license management, et cetera, and then help you in the deployment into the Kubernetes cluster. We also focus on making it really simple through a process we call Auto DevOps, which is an opinionated YAML file that helps you ensure that your first deployments and your ongoing deployments into your Kubernetes cluster work phenomenally. So with that said, uh, obviously we love Kubernetes because uh, for Developers, nothing's more important than a consistent deployment and a great environment as people are developing more and more uh, applications, but obviously making them an, uh, a much more polyglot environment. Uh, there's a whole bunch more needs microservices that these need to be solved. So we spend a lot of time uh, on that side, uh, solving for Kubernetes and making it really easy to bring the dev and the op side together. Um, additionally, we spend quite a bit of time and are moving into the serverless space. Uh, same pattern that we brought before of making Kubernetes e easily accessible for developers. Uh, we also focus on making now serverless easy and accessible to developers while doing that through uh, a full managed solution that's, that's critical for both the security and the speed. And then I think probably lastly, uh, spend a bit of time on security. These are areas I touched on briefly. You'll see all of the links at the top uh, of my web browser so you can take a look at those anytime you would want. But with that said, why don't we jump into uh, the landscape. Again, this is a landscape we still work to this day uh, closely with just about every one of these partners in helping them get new workloads into their Kubernetes clusters. And so uh, the pattern I wanted to do is send a little bit of overview on what this entire ecosystem currently looks like. And you will see that here and if you haven't taken a look the cncf has a great interactive landscape that covers a whole bunch of these uh, we're going to focus most of the time around the platform vendors uh, today but there's plenty of other places for you to dig in and learn quite a bit more about them uh, so that said i'm going to start kind of in chronological order so if we backtrack and kind of go back to the beginnings of where this all played out everything and everyone relies on a huge investment from Docker. Uh, and when Docker first started, it was all about containerization. Uh, and there were a bunch of ideas out there before. So Google had uh, a well-named one called, let me containerify that for you. Uh, thankfully, that was sunset in favor of Docker when they came out. And really, this was kind of the foundation that we've all built on. Now, one of the interesting things when Docker got started is they started with something called Swarm. If you're not yet familiar with it, uh, Swarm was a very easy to get started, easy to run orchestration tool. And again, we'll be talking orchestration tools all day today with the primary focus on Kubernetes. Uh, it was 
um, really, again, back to Swarm, what Docker harnessed in, uh, in Docker, well, they really extended into Swarm. So easy to approach, easy to get started. Um, over time, uh, that evolved, was got a lot of good support from Microsoft, good focus around Windows. Um, but they did eventually, uh, over time, Swarm was uh, probably usurped by Kubernetes. And in true fashion, as everything's evolved, Docker's also evolved initially into what was called uh, Kubernetes and Swarm mode. So they, you can run Kubernetes and Swarm next to each other, and to this day, you still can. Uh, and now they've evolved their offering into uh, what is Docker Enterprise. And if you look here, Docker Enterprise is their fully managed solution that includes uh, their Kubernetes service, but is also on top of Docker Engine uh, with Docker Hub, image repository, and registry, a number of their dev tools, uh, which they continue to do really well. So that's kind of where they started and where they're headed now. Uh, again, one of the very best in the business. Who else was out in the market before Kubernetes came in? And I'd be remiss if I didn't go and take a look and we didn't talk about Red Hat and particularly OpenShift. Now, the interesting piece is OpenShift has been around for a while, full platform as a service, still in many ways operates as a platform as a service with a lot of additional value add on top of Kubernetes. Uh, but if you go back to uh, OpenShift 2, Enterprise 2, uh, it was a very different product. Uh, and at that time, you'll see here, um, instead of containers, uh, OpenShift used gears. Instead of Kubernetes, uh, they actually would have used, and I'm going to get this, make sure I get this correct. Instead of orchestration, they used uh, a broker, so an OpenShift broker host instead. Now, what Red Hat picked up really quickly when Kubernetes first came out is they made a very quick early bet that Kubernetes would be the best tool for doing the orchestration uh, behind the scenes at OpenShift. And they made this bet before they were really sure whether or not OpenShift, or I'm sorry, whether Kubernetes was going to be the winner in this uh, evolution. And so they did it, though, simply believing it was the best tool to orchestrate a pass. As it turns out, hey, seems like they made a pretty good bet. Uh, they jumped in early and have been one of the very biggest contributors uh, throughout all of the years. Um, that said, their big uh, transition from OpenShift 2, which had, uh, again, as always, open source technologies, but shifting to Kubernetes and OpenShift 3 came out in June of 2015 and went GA. Now, that's outstanding and they've continued to evolve. Um, Want to give you a little bit of an idea of, I think, where we see them going, going forward. Now, as they just released OpenShift 4 and they've moved um, on, what is most interesting for them is going to be around a couple pieces. Big one here is operator framework. We'll talk a bit about this, but an operator framework from the simplest of terms is allowing other ISVs and other uh, software to run on top of Kubernetes. And it allows an operator framework what allows you not to just deploy an application, but to maintain it throughout its life cycle. There's been a number of other ways to do this. Uh, Helm uh, was, uh, is, a, is another common one but it looks like probably operator framework is the one that certainly Red Hat's making a bet on and a number of others are. A couple other things that they're focused on from a velocity standpoint is around serverless and their serverless, similar to a couple others, are making a bet on was Knative. Uh, Knative allows serverless to run on top of a Kubernetes cluster anywhere that you'd wanna do it. So great place there. Again, they made the shift early and they continue to run with it. Uh, I think one of the most important things, though, in the market right now that is being asked is what's going on with IBM. So what I wanted to do is give you guys uh, a little bit of context. Uh, IBM before uh, they bought Red Hat, and then a little bit of maybe some guesses as to where I'm going to guess they're going to head now that uh, they own Red Hat. Uh, so early on, IBM made a big bet actually with another uh, platform called Cloud Foundry. Uh, Cloud Foundry was also more of a PaaS, and so you'll see, even to this day, you'll see Cloud Foundry and OpenShift continue to be two of the probably um, most opinionated and best adopted PaaSs in the market. Um, IBM adopted and has been a big contributor to Cloud Foundry. Pivotal was the biggest. We'll get to them in a moment. Um, they made a bet for that for the application development. You'll see here the, new, the part that Cloud Foundry did really well is 
<laughs> something called CF push and it was command line deploy and push your application. And uh, it was transformative, still is, and makes it extremely easy to develop, grow and continue to evolve. Now, one of the areas that is really interesting in how they bridge the gap, uh, what you would end up with in Cloud Foundry is you end up with a completely different backend to, Kuber to Kubernetes. It uses uh, something functionally known primarily around Bosch and Diego. Those are the two primary technologies for um, container runtime. Those are core to Cloud Foundry and IBM made that adoption of Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes. So they ended up with really two different platforms. In order to bring them together, there's a project called Irini. And this project is one that focuses on rebasing Cloud Foundry uh, application runtime to run on top of Kubernetes. Um, IBM was a big proponent they, um, of this along with SAP and SUSE, uh, who also are big contributors to both, uh, uh, both groups. So they contribute heavily to both Kubernetes and to Cloud Foundry. And so this is actually something <clears throat> that's still in place, going to continue to evolve, but works very well for someone that wants to have a consistent backend that they manage. And you can imagine that works really well for IBM. Um, where are they going in the future? Well, I think aside from the OpenShift question of what IBM does with OpenShift and how that fits, uh, uh, IBM actually has two primary offerings this today of IBM Cloud Kubernetes Service. So um, this is a fully managed Kubernetes service that runs on their public cloud. And the second one that they have is known as IBM Cloud Private. Now IBM Cloud Private is designed to run in your own data center. Uh, it's designed to run on your own hardware. Uh, and it actually pulls together a couple of frameworks. It's not just a Kubernetes cluster, but that uh, the previous piece that we looked at, the work around Irini, allowed them to run IBM Cloud Private on-prem and deliver all of the container love that they loved with Kubernetes and Cloud Foundry and run it on a s single backend uh, Kubernetes. And so that's certainly something that uh, I, we expect they'll continue to do, but it will be interesting to see how this fits in with uh, OpenShift. A couple other quick things that I'd note that IBM's been big contributors to. A uh, big investment for them in Istio uh, for a service mesh. This is together with Google. A number of other people are also using it, but those would be the two biggest. Um, so those are good. Let me go a little bit back in time uh, to cover what was going on and where uh, Pivotal is. So historically, Pivotal was very well known for Cloud Foundry, still is. They're the primary contributor. They nail this use case. There's hundreds of enterprise customers that have taken advantage of uh, Cloud Foundry and everything that Pivotal brings. Um, all of that is largely orchestrated and runs on top of Bosch. So let me give it a little color. Bosch is, again, that alternative. Bosch, to be overly simple, uh, naming is pretty interesting. It came from a combination of Borg, uh, which is Google's scheduler and also was the grandfather to Kubernetes. Uh, combined with SSH. So Bosch is half Bosch, half the simple of the SSH, and you're off and running. Uh, it continues to be the foundation of their Kubernetes offering. Uh, Pivotal runs what is known as PKS on top of Bosch, uh, runs it in conjunction with Harbor, uh, which is a container registry, uh, and then tightly coupled together with NSXT from VMware, uh, their parent company. So a lot of really good work there on the networking side, which is one of the more complex pieces to solve when you get into a Kubernetes distribution. Now, with that said, it can run anywhere. Uh, that's obviously one of the big value propositions to uh, Red Hat with OpenShift, with Pivotal, with Cloud Foundry, and their PKS offering. Uh, their PKS offering is designed to really meet people anywhere you come from. So they really have three offerings, uh, something that is called Essential PKS, uh, that is, uh, comes out of uh, Heptio, and we'll talk about that a little bit when I get to VMware. The Enterprise PKS, which is a uh, descendant of a project called Kubo, uh, which came from Kubernetes plus Bosch, so we'll, we'll put those together. Uh, Kubo is now what is known as Enterprise PKS, which can also run on a public cloud on your VMware public cloud and would be called Cloud PKS. So we'll hit on a couple of those. I think in the future, it's going to be really interesting to see where Pivotal and VMware continue to evolve. They've really hardened and brought some really good, unique 
viewpoints to the Kubernetes uh, space continue to contribute very highly. They also bring a lot of what you need to run in your own data center. Uh, and obviously VMware is, is very strong there and Pivotal knows how to develop better than anyone in the business. So those are the worlds you came through, but we are missing one that's really important to bring to the table and that is Mesosphere. So again, all of this happened, these technologies existed before Kubernetes uh, was here and it's another orchestrator orchestration tool, which was um, Apache Mesos. Now Apache Mesos was evolved by Mesosphere into what they're offering is even today known as Mesosphere DCOS or Data Center Operating System. The strength of DCOS is it's a two-level uh, two scheduler. Uh, we gain nuances that some other time, but the importance to know about this is uh, Mesosphere built their orchestration predominantly around data. And not a surprise, if you look there, anything that's really an Apache project has been something that Mesosphere has done, operized, and maintained extremely well. And you'll see that even here in their literature with the focus on the data science. Um, that said, a lot of the application areas, the application development has moved more to a cloud native, in this case, Kubernetes, and they've come out with a strong Mesosphere Kubernetes engine. Value on this continues to be a, is a customer, the most customers run uh, Mesosphere and DCOS, as it's known, in their own data center. And what this delivers is a universal orchestrator, universal uh, scheduler for all of your large big data workloads, as well as Kubernetes, all running on top of it. And so uh, that's very useful for, uh, for their customers in that use case. Uh, they continue to expand and uh, deliver on a lot of it, give you a sense, uh, obviously, the places that they might run, uh, and you can dig into a bit more around Mesosphere Kubernetes engine, uh, obviously, on all of the links. So that brings us to the beginning of Kubernetes. And I thought it'd just be fun to take a quick look at the first commit uh, ever on June 6, 2014, by Joe Beta into the Kubernetes project. And so um, he started, it started very simple. Uh, the externalization of this was very simple. Uh, Google was ha was looking and ran and always still runs everything in a container, uh, including their VMs running containers just for fun. So it's, as everyone likes to say, turtles all the way down. But Google needed an answer to what was going on in the marketplace, uh, particularly with Amazon that had a very strong messaging and the world completely consolidated around EC2 and VMs. And so... Uh, they came out with Kubernetes. Uh, they contributed very heavily into Docker and making sure that that was supported. Um, but they had some opinions because of Borg on what a scheduler really needed to be able to deliver. And so a lot of that is really good stewards. That founding team stewarded it really well, but it really, this is kind of the first, first place that they would, would have started. Um, that said, uh, about a year later, uh, on the one-year anniversary of Kubernetes, we got what we now know as CNCF. So CNCF's first project and donation that was put in it was the Kubernetes project. It was put in there by Google. A uh, whole bunch of other great founding members uh, that joined it well at the beginning. Uh, and that was the goal is to get Kubernetes out from a specific company and into what we now know as a foundation uh, for what we've now seen from CNCF, which is is pretty, uh, truly impressive in terms of where it's grown. And it's been a pretty amazing ride uh, to watch each KubeCon grow, but also all the different use cases, uh, all the fascinating people that have jumped in to make sure that this runs as well as it possibly can. So from that, though, uh, Google jumped in and focused on commercializing it. And they commercialized it first as what is GKE, uh, that evolved into Anthos, but GKE was definitely the first managed Kubernetes out there. Uh, it's one that continues to be industry leading in both its capabilities uh, and now where it runs. And so uh, Google took a step uh, about two years ago into initially was what's called GKE on-prem. Uh, it's now involved into what is known as the Anthos platform. And Anthos can run anywhere. Uh, Anthos can run your workload in GKE if you want to run it on Google on GCP, but it can run on-prem uh, in your VMware environment, and it can run on other public clouds as well. Uh, this continues to be a place that I think Google's going to push uh, the boundaries of how to bring what is really now a very diverse CNCF 
uh, ecosystem together in a way that it's easy, it's managed, it runs anywhere. Uh, and so we'll see this is gonna be a really interesting uh, point. Naturally, this brought bluntly Google into a very direct competition with uh, what is now Red Hat and IBM uh, for the value proposition of being able to take your workload, that workload portability across any public cloud and anywhere on-prem. So I think we'll see a number of people competing here, but this is one to look for. And certainly uh, they've done an excellent job across the board. Uh, that said, I think the other player, another player in here is gonna be Amazon. We know today Amazon uh, has a great Kubernetes offering in EKS, but they didn't start with that. So when Docker first came out, Amazon jumped in because of their very strong uh, customer focus in making it easy to run containers. And so even really before, I think you'd say even really before um, Swarm, and, as Swarm and Kubernetes were getting started, ECS was launched. And ECS was simply a, um, a very easy way to run whatever you've containerized. So uh, it doesn't run anywhere but Amazon, but it is deeply integrated, as you can see here, into the identity access management, all their CloudWatch events, CloudFormation, CloudTrail. So if you're in Amazon, this is a really good way to run your container services. However, um, over time, it became very clear that Amazon also needed to support Kubernetes. And so they made, as they always do in listening to the, to the customers, hey, time to jump in and really invest in making Kubernetes work as a uh, fully managed service on top of Amazon. Now, I love what they're doing. I think there's some other really fun stuff you could jump in, uh, in and if you haven't picked this up, Amazon has open sourced their container roadmap and this covers ECS, which we just chatted about, also covers EKS. And so I would strongly encourage you if you're looking to jump in to look at their container roadmap, look at where they are uh, developing, make those comments, um, big, big fan of where uh, the entire team, Deepak, uh, Bob Wise, and their team are all headed on, on this side. Um, that said, we should also make sure we don't miss Microsoft. And I think Microsoft's taken a fascinating way of getting here. Um, if we go back, Microsoft has actually worked with all of the above uh, container uh, orchestration tools that we've talked about. So they started out early on supporting Mesos or DCOS on Azure as a fully managed service. Uh, that was really their uh, first direction that they went. Uh, when, as Docker came out with Swarm, jumped on the bandwagon, did a really good job of helping make sure that Docker Swarm ran well on Azure. Um, however, those have all uh, evolved, and as, Amazon, as Azure rolled out what is AKS or Azure Kubernetes service, uh, they've moved to sunset those other orchestrators. So at this point, uh, Azure has now shifted to Kubernetes being their also uh, primary focus around container orchestration. So it'll be interesting to see as that, uh, that moves forward. The big focus on this as it was before with Docker is around getting Windows into the Kubernetes environment. So uh, I think we continue to look forward to them making those contributions and making uh, Kubernetes work great with Windows. Uh, and they did that great, obviously, first time through with Docker and the foundational pieces that were necessary. Look forward to them continuing to do that uh, with the Kubernetes space. So with that, um, and here a quick link to, you're welcome to go take a look at AKS. I uh, want to hit a few other ones that I think are interesting. First off, I think fascinating where VMware stands. VMware is where they are uh, both through all the work that they do with Pivotal and what you got with is PKS. They also acquired Heptio. So Heptio was a, an independent company founded by uh, Joe Beta and Craig McClucky, two of the founders, split off and started a new company. Heptio was acquired recently by VMware and uh, they're hard at work in integrating and bringing Kubernetes to the enterprise at all the places that VMware runs. We're gonna be watching that real carefully. Um, but again, uh, lots to be seen there. But I think VMware is getting real serious about uh, about this space. So another area um, we'll kick off, and this is almost uh, a backtrack because it might not even be known. So uh, hopefully Rancher will appreciate the fact they started originally when this all came out with a platform called Cattle. Uh, now, 
rancher picked up extremely early on that uh, the importance of orchestration was pretty complex and they made a quick and uh, robust shift over to being a centralized tool for managing any of your Kubernetes clusters. As it turns out, there's a couple other really great things I want to call out for that they're doing. Not only a great uh, um, independent pure Kubernetes player, uh, I think their model is fascinating. Um, I'm biased. I love their uh, open core model. So real easy for anyone to get started with Rancher. And then as you mature, um, you can pick up the additional uh, support and some of the additional features, but it's real easy to get started and run Kubernetes anywhere you want to. They're also really heavily involved in making sure it can run anywhere. A uh, great project they just launched, which is K3S. So if you're not familiar with it, Kate's is Kubernetes is K eight letters and S. K3S doesn't mean anything. I don't know what the three letters are in the middle, but it's a very like Kubernetes distro and allows it to run just about anywhere. I'll look forward to that because certainly Kubernetes on the edge is another area we're starting to see it. So with that said, one last one and a new entry into the space for managed is DigitalOcean. Um, they always do a great job for developers. And let's be honest, hey, anyone and or no one ever gets tired of the awesome droplets that they deliver. They focus ease of use for anyone to get up and running. So that was a quick flyby. One last little piece here uh, that is worth a fun read uh, to see how these come together. And it is here. This is a use case from the CNCF that uses GitLab. And I will zoom in here for you all to what is a very interesting um, picture. And this is actually what the CNCF has done is in order to test uh, all of the graduated projects against all the different providers, which you'll see on the, in, the, in the columns, against the projects uh, in the rows, they leverage GitLab to do that CI CD and the testing uh, to make sure they were tested, they ran, um, et cetera. And so interesting use case here on um, what we're doing with a lot of the different groups and right down to the uh, core CNCF and helping make sure that the code that is written is well tested, is well secured, and uh, everyone gets to move even faster. So these are some of the important places we continue to work with the CNCF. That said, so much appreciate y'all's time. Please um, take a little bit of time, come visit our virtual booth in the exhibition hall for a deeper dive into what we're doing with Kubernetes and how we can help you get started no matter where it is in the entire CNCF and Kubernetes ecosystem that you want to get started. So with that, thank you and have a great day.